Friday. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dustin Kerr with the State Building Code Council. Uh, before we get started, I'd love, like to give you an idea how this public meeting will work. State Building Code Council has, is holding a public hearing for proposed rulemaking related to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code residential and commercial provisions. The proposed changes are posted on the rulemaking page, uh, 2021 code adoption cycle of the SBCC website and on the website for public hearing. The purpose of the rulemaking hearing and comment period is to provide the public with an opportunity to comment on the proposed changes to the WAC language. So this is your opportunity to let us know your thoughts on the specific changes. You can do so by testifying and or submitting written comments. Written comments can be submitted via email to sbcc at des.wa.gov. When you registered to participate in this hearing, you indicated your intent to testify today. When we get to the part of the hearing, the hearing officer will call your name and invite you to speak. You'll be unmuted if attending through Zoom, or you can approach the table if testifying in person. Remember to state your name for the record. People will be called up in the order they signed up to testify. In order to ensure that everyone has a chance to make comments in a timely manner, please limit your comments to three minutes or less. The hearing officer will let you know when you have about a minute left to wrap up and when it's been three minutes and to finish up. So the next person may have their turn. Remember, you can also submit your comments in writing via email or postal mail. Just as a reminder, this hearing is for the specific proposed rules changes to the 2021, uh, excuse me, this hearing is for the specific proposed rule changes to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code addressing concerns regarding federal preemption. If you have comments about issues that aren't specific to these proposed changes, please provide those to staff separately. The deadline for written testimony is 5 p.m. today, November 22nd. As we do with all hearings, the audio will be recorded. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, my name is Damon Doyle. I'll be the SBCC's designated hearing officer today and will be conducting this hearing. I now call to order this hearing regarding WAC 5111R and WAC 5111C, amendment of the 2021 Washington State Energy Code residential and commercial provisions. I'd like to advise everyone that this hearing is being recorded and that the audio file will become part of the official rulemaking file. For the record, this hearing is being held today on November 22nd, 2023, beginning at approximately 10 a.m. via Zoom and in person here in Olympia. <clears throat> the purpose of this hearing is to receive public comments and revisions to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code residential commercial provisions. This hearing is being conducted in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, RCW 4230, and the Administrative Procedures Act, RCW 3405. Legal notice of this hearing was filed with the Washington State Code Revisor on October 18th, 2023. The Washington State Register number for WAC 5111R is WSR 2321105, and for WAC 5111C is WSR 2321106. Notice of this hearing was also posted on the SBC website, sbcc.wa.gov. This hearing is being held to consider testimony on the proposed CR 102. At this time, I'll briefly explain the changes. The council is entering rulemaking to modify sections in the commercial and residential energy codes to address legal uncertainties stemming from the decision in California Restaurant Association versus the City of Berkeley that was recently issued by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The council solicited proposals to address these concerns and is proposing several changes to the energy code. In the residential provisions, the set sections that specify the use of heat pump space water heating have been removed and section 406 is modified to use a gas heating baseline, which means the number of required credits is increased to adjust to this change to maintain the level of energy efficiency. Additionally, credit options applicable to gas appliances are added to R406. Minor changes were made to section R405 and chapter five to correlate with the removal of mandatory heat pump requirements. In the commercial provisions, there are two options being proposed. Only one of these options will be adopted in the final rule. 
Both options achieve the same effect, but reach them by different methods. Option one established a fossil fuel compliance path in section C 401.3 and outlines within that section other changes that are required throughout the code. Option two makes changes throughout the code sections to establish requirements for fossil fuel appliances. Both options contain a number of the same changes. Both options also require an increased number of additional energy efficiency credits when fossil fuel appliances are used in order to maintain the level of efficiency provided by heat pumps. Both options also include the same new credit options for gas appliances. We will now hear oral testimony regarding the proposed changes. For the record, please identify yourself and whom you represent, if any. Please speak clearly so we can get a good record of your testimony. In order to ensure that everyone has a chance to make comments in a timely manner, please try to limit your comments to three minutes. This hearing is being held to consider testimony on the currently filed proposals for WAC 5111R of the Washington State Energy Code residential provisions and WAC 5111C, the Washington State Energy Code commercial provisions. All testimony presented at this hearing, along with written comments received, will be part of the official hearing record for this proposal. A final decision on adopting this rule proposal will be made on November 28th, 2023. On behalf of the State Building Code Council, I'd like to thank you for participating in today's hearing. Okay, so we've got our list of uh, people signed up to testify. Uh, first person on the list is Andrea Smith, the IAW. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Counselors, and staff. For the record, my name is Andrea Smith, and I'm here today on behalf of the Building Industry Association of Washington. We are a trade association of more than 8,000 members representing all segments of the construction industry. We are here today to voice our opposition to the proposed amendments to the Residential Energy Code. While we understand and support the desire to lower emissions in the built environment, we are in the midst of a housing, affordable housing emergency that threatens the quality of life for my generation and those after us. What is completely baffling to me is that the emissions problem is not new homes, it's the existing building stock. We can afford to wait to adopt the new energy code. If for no other reason, then we are already surpassing our efficiency targets. You'll recall the entire reason behind reworking the code was to ensure compliance with EPCA. Not partial compliance, but full compliance. And even with the changes, the code is still not compliant under the building code exemptions listed within EPCA. To illustrate, condition D has not been met. The simulated performance pathway uses a standard reference design based on HVAC products that exceed federal efficiency standards. This is why builders rarely, if ever, use this pathway. Therefore, condition B has also not been met. The code effectively requires use of the prescriptive pathway due to the absence of an adequate performance pathway, and therefore products exceeding federal efficiency standards are by default required. Condition C has also not been met. The code fails to meet the one-for-one -one equivalent energy use test. Because the tag conflates carbon emissions with energy use, they voted to keep what is known in the 2018 code as the fuel normalization table, and instead retitled it to the energy equalization table to hide its true intent, penalizing fossil fuel appliances and credit achievement. This table provides extra credit for the same appliances that is used in high efficiency HVAC options. In BIW versus Washington State Building Code Council in 2012, it warned that to survive preemption, credits must be given in proportion to energy use savings without favoring particular products or methods. And condition F has also not been met. There is no coherent objective outlined by the SBCC in terms of a target for energy use reduction for each building type. This fails another requirement for the exemption. The chair, thank you. The chair of our tag incorrectly assumes if one path complies with EPCA, the entire code complies. That is simply not true. All paths to compliance must, must be EPCA compliant, per precedent set in ACHRI versus City of Albuquerque. I urge you to do the right thing and suspend implementation indefinitely of the 2021 Energy Code. Continuing to to increase the cost to build homes in our great state will have devastating effects on home ownership attainability for decades. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Next, we have Joseph Swaja. Hi, uh, I'm Joe Swaja from the Sierra Club. Please pass option one of the commercial CR 102. It provides legal safeguards 
provides flexibility for, for builders while still meeting the vital climate goals of our code. So um, the rest of it's just gonna be a little song. Here we go. Let's pass option one. Got to get it done. We must protect our code and stop this carbon overload. At the risk of sounding good, at the risk of sounding cool, let's stop from getting sued. Because if we don't soon electrify our grand kids, by just up and dive your building council. And we count on you to help our precious climate. So please follow through. We can be creative and still meet the goal. While evolving in the costumes, so please fulfill your role. Please pass option one. We've got to get it done. We must protect our code and stop a carbon overload. Thank you, SBCC, for helping electrify our it means so much that you help it electrify. One minute. Thank you. Please pass option one. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Gary Heikinen, Northwest Natural. Tough act to follow there. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Gary Heikinen, uh, and I'm an energy consultant working on behalf of Northwest Natural. I've been a member of the Energy Code TAG since 2015, and since then have watched the Energy Code devolve into one of the most complicated and unbalanced energy codes in the country. The proposed options to strike the ex explicit heat pump mandate and overt ban on the use of gas equipment for space and water heating is prudent in order to avoid federal preemption issues. However, the proposed fix to add a fossil fuel compliance path with extremely onerous requirements doesn't solve the problem and results in a de facto ban of gas equipment anyway. The proposed options to strike the explicit heat pump mandate and overt ban on the use of natural gas um, Im imposes uh, additional and what amounts to prohibitive credits required on top of the base credits needed for compliance. These additional credits result in a 200 to 700 percent increase in the number of re number required to use this path. This defies all reasonableness and is at the core of this de latest de facto ban on gas. Incremental first costs associated with these additional credits will also be significant and should not be ignored. The council should demand that a first cost analysis be done before voting on either option. These additional credits were calculated by comparing gas and electric equipment efficiencies on a site energy basis. Using site energy completely ignores all the upstream losses associated with getting that energy to the building. For electricity, this includes the losses resulting from generation, transmission, and distribution. At best, electricity is delivered to buildings at a 50% efficiency, and at worst, during peak consumption periods, that efficiency drops to around 30 to 35%. For comparison, natural gas is delivered to buildings at a 91% efficiency. So on a source energy basis, that 250 to 300 percent efficient heat pump is actually running at a half or a third of that. One minute. If there is to be a fossil fuel compliance path in the code, the additional credit should be calculated on source energy basis, which will result in a more accurate comparison between electric and gas options. Some on TAG have stated that the issue of source versus site energy is simply a distraction. It is not a distraction, but as a fatal technical flaw and it's being used to try and justify these ill-conceived efforts to prohibit gas. Having failed to do so overtly, it's now trying to obscure the facts 
of how the accurately how to accurately compare efficiency of energy sources to justify prohibitive credit levels required for gas equipment. If comparisons are to be made between gas and electric systems, it must be done on a source energy basis. Please disapprove the proposals as submitted that would impose these additional credits based on site energy and direct that the additional credits be recalculated based on source energy. This would be a relatively easy task to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Kevin Duell. Oh, thank you, Chair, and to the Council. I'm Kevin Duell with Northwest Natural and a member of the Energy Code TAG. I'm concerned the proposed 2021 residential code is too challenging to comply with. Builders and energy modelers have reported that for homes with gas appliances, the required additional credits are too high to be achieved. Anecdotally, they're saying they're coming up short by about half a credit. Failing to provide a pathway where builders can install EPCA covered gas appliances in practice would violate EPCA. The council is tasked with meeting legislative goals for re reducing energy use. Analysis by PNNL shows the 2021 residential code reduces energy use to 37% of the 2006 baseline. That puts the code far enough ahead to meet the 2027 interim target. The residential code could be left alone for two code cycles and still be on track. I'm all for progressive energy efficiency, tempered by the cost to implement it. Is now the time to exceed leg legislative goals so dramatically, driving up housing costs when interest rates are high and housing stock is in short supply, and while reducing emissions from the total housing stock by less than 2% over the next few decades? To that cost point, BIAW estimates that the 21 code will add roughly $9,000 for all electric homes and $30,000 for homes with gas heating. That $30,000 cost for gas homes leads to my next concern. Does this code change address the preemption issues with EPCA? No, the change does not. The average home in Washington is 2,185 square feet. That $30,000 is an additional cost of almost $14 per square foot. That's profound. That's prohibitive. Pivoting to commercial code, a building using gas for space and water heating will have to follow the fossil fuel path. That path requires between two to seven times as many additional credits, depending on the occupancy. Using, using the cost of renewable energy credits as a proxy for the dramatically higher number of credits required, for an office building, the estimated cost is on the order of $7 per square foot. That's also profound. That's also prohibitive. And a photovoltaic system size to get those credits may not even fit on the roof. These extreme costs do not align with the spirit of EPCA and the 2023 Berkeley decision by the Ninth Circuit Court. This code still leaves the council with EPCA preemption liability. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Nancy Henderson. Good morning. Um, I am here on behalf of Archaecology and Shift Zero, and I am here to urge you to adopt the amendments to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code, both the residential and commercial. Um, please pass option one of the commercial CR 102 with the changes recommended by RMI in their comment letter submitted on 11 20 2023. Specifically, we want to ensure that the final code includes the amended language they are proposing for the heat pump water heating credit, along with the removal of the supplemental gas heat from air source heat pumps and the clarification on the electric readiness for space heating and water heating. We believe this is a better position legally because it gives contractors flexibility to choose appliances as they achieve energy efficiency. These changes maintain the intent of the code to transition away from pollution generating generating gas towards clean and affordable electricity. Um, I appreciate all the comments about cost, but um, our time for incremental small changes has passed and um, we urgently need to make some drastic changes. Thank you. Thank you. Where's Marshall? 
Thank you, Council, for uh, making time to take public comments. Uh, my name is Rick Marshall, and I'm a builder and developer down here in Southwest Washington. I have over 35 years of experience in residential energy efficiency. I strongly encourage the Council to adopt the Energy Code amendments under consideration, specifically Option 1 for the Commercial Code. I also encourage you to seriously consider the amendments suggested by RMI. You know, RMI has been providing valuable energy efficiency analysis for decades, and I've long relied on their research and insights. I think it's important to remember that they got their start not simply at trying to reduce pollution, but really trying to make us more energy secure as a nation. You know, I've always been inspired by the energy efficiency pioneers, and we've tried to do our part. One example, we built an energy efficient duplex that meets passive uh, um, house airflow standards. My mother-in-law lives in the lower flat, and I just looked up her energy bills for August and September of this year. She paid $34 and $39, basically 10 kilowatt hours per day. These were very bad months for our PUD, and they were seeing close to $1,000 per megawatt hour in the wholesale markets on some days. You know, we had a limited budget and couldn't afford any fancy windows or appliances, and she gets by with a single head ductless heat pump. Still, she gets great year-round comfort, some nice acoustic separation from her neighbor upstairs in the apartment complex next door. Good indoor air quality when we have wildfire smoke. And I know we've got a more durable building. You know, essentially any weather has to penetrate exterior insulation, building wrap, um, an air and weather barrier before ever getting to any of the actual structure. All elements are semi-permeable, so water vapor can move in both directions, just like the building science folks recommend, and I think it works. But here's the kicker. We built this duplex back in 2009. I highlight it not to brag, but to point out just how doable increased energy efficiency really is. There are much better builders out there, and the production folks really know how to make things cost effective. The last 14 years has given us better materials and know-how, better appliances and HVAC systems. It's all very doable. We need to get this code updated and get back to building. My last point, being energy efficient is great for someone like my mother-in-law who gets by on a fixed income. She can't afford to spend a lot on AC or heating. But energy efficiency is is not just important to limited income folks. If we don't build more energy efficient, then we could all be without AC if we don't moderate new demand. Remember, energy efficiency really means energy security for all of us. Thanks again, Council, for taking public comments. Um, Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Martha Baskin. Martha Baskin. All right, can you hear me? Yes? Yes. All right. Yes, good morning to you. Um, I am with the Sierra Club um, and I'm urging the State Building Code Council to adopt these amendments to the 21 Washington State Energy Code, adding my voice to please pass option one, specifically to ensure amended language for the heat pump water heating credit, the removal of supplemental gas heating from air source heat pumps, and the clarification on the electric readiness language being made available for both space and water heating. Reducing emissions from new buildings is crucial to protecting our climate and air quality and our health. Electric heat pumps are a double one, double win. Not only do they reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, but they provide heating alongside cooling, which is only growing more intense as our region sees more and more wildfire smoke and heat waves. Again, for reasons of public health, we must immediately transition away from gas appliances that spew methane, nitrogen oxides, and even carcinogens like benzene into the air we breathe and switch to clean technology. Please pass these amendments to protect strong codes and ensure that new buildings in Washington are as climate friendly and cost effective as possible. Thank you so much. Very good Thanksgiving or however you appreciate all that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Deepa Savarajan. Yes, thank you. My name is Deepa Savarajan. I'm the Washington Local Policy Manager at Climate Solutions. I'm here to testify in support of the amendments to the 2021 Residential and Commercial Energy Codes, and specifically in support of option one of the commercial CR 102 with the recommended changes that RMI made in their comment submitted on Monday. 
ensuring that the amended language for the heat pump water heating credit, the removal of supplemental gas heating from air source heat pumps, and the clarification on the electric readiness language being available for both space and water heating appliances are included in the final code language. I've also shared a written comment that is signed by numerous organizations and businesses across the state in support of the amendments. Washington State's 2021 Clean Energy Strategy found that electrification is the lowest cost pathway to achieving our statutory climate goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 95% below 1990 levels by 2050. And the Washington State Legislature has previously directed the SBCC to set codes in line with these targets. Last year, Climate Solutions joined organizations and thousands of residents across Washington in supporting the heat pump amendments to the 2021 Commercial and Residential Energy Codes to comply with these state requirements, building off of the work of Seattle, Shoreline, Bellingham, and King County, local jurisdictions which passed strong climate-friendly codes in 2021 and 2022. The current proposed amendments preserve the impact of the codes to achieve these statutory targets while providing legal safeguards and more flexibility for builders to choose appliances as they achieve energy performance. I also want to urge the council to pass these amendments on schedule instead of instituting any further delay. As you heard yesterday from Olympia City Council member Lisa Parsley, many local governments that I'm in contact with are relying on the SBCC's work to support their own climate action. For example, the city of Tacoma halted their own analysis of building decarbonization strategies for new construction in the city because the state had already taken action, expecting that the codes would be implemented earlier this year. With the codes now set to go into effect in spring 2024, any further delay would be incredibly burdensome to local governments, not to mention unfair to builders and developers in the local jurisdictions who passed clean energy codes in 2021 and 2022 who need a level playing field and consistency across the state. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Thomas. Okay, how about now? There you go. Okay, thank you. My name is Kelly Thomas. I'm the manager of sustainability initiatives for Spokane City Council. Spokane is a four season climate with some pretty harsh winters and very hot summers. We are committed to building codes that support decarbonization that consider these extreme temperatures such as heat pumps designed for cold climates. Our poorest and most vulnerable neighborhoods sit in the middle of punishing heat islands with very little tree canopy. A more permanent solution than air conditioners and fans would be welcome. We know that buildings are still the fastest growing sources of emissions, so Spokane is prioritizing the use of efficient and renewable energy that meets Washington Clean Buildings Act EUI targets. The city of Spokane relies upon the state code to move forward on our own internal strategies. These amendments maintain the intent of the strong energy code adopted last year toward clean and affordable electricity, and so we support approval without further delay. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Sarah Robinson. Hello, my name is Sarah Robinson and I speak from the unceded lands of the Ohlone people. As advocacy manager for Earth Ministry Washington Interfaith Power and Light, I speak in concert with thousands of affiliated people of faith and conscience, as well as hundreds of member congregations. Our planetary fever is on the rise and scientists, leaders, and civil society are calling for all hands on deck for the climate crisis. In Washington, our state already suffers with more drought, floods, glacier melt, wildfire, heat waves, and other hazards that hurt our most vulnerable most acutely. To avoid the worst and restore the means for our communities to both adapt and thrive, reducing emissions from new buildings is crucial to protect our climate and air quality and our health. Improving buildings, both homes and businesses will further integrate climate and health goals into our region. Please adopt these amendments, especially option one for commercial, which will maintain the intent of the strong energy code passed last year by the council. Washington communities deserve their best chance to thrive. And if we neglect to adapt to our changing climate, already overburdened and underserved community members will pay the price. 
We must face this moment courageously and do our utmost to protect our communities from harm. Your hard work and timely response matters so much to support community well-being in our built environments. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Richard Boguet. I am not seeing him in our guest list. Richard, if you are there, please raise your hand and we can get you permission to talk. Okay. We'll move on to Dan Welch. Thank you, Cancel. My name is Dan Welch of Bundle Design Studio. Bundle is an architecture firm located in Bellingham. Our work consists of 75% residential and 25% commercial projects across the Puget Sound area. In Washington state, buildings are still the fastest growing sources of carbon emissions. And efforts to accelerate a transition to a highly efficient heat pumps is crucial to preventing further climate catastrophe and to create resilient buildings with cooling benefits during increasingly hot summers. We urge the Code Council to adopt the proposed amendments to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code for both residential and commercial. On the residential side, for over a decade, Bundle has been designing all electric low energy buildings that meet. Hello, members of the Washington State Building Code. Good morning. I think we cut off the previous speaker somehow. We did. Dan, if you could unmute, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sorry about that, Dan. Okay. Okay. Let me let me start from the top here. Uh, my name is Dan Welch, um, Bundle Design Studio. Bundle is an architecture firm located in Bellingham. Our work consists of 75% residential and 25% commercial projects across the Puget Sound area. In Washington state, buildings are still the fastest growing sources of carbon emissions and efforts to accelerate a transition to a highly efficient heat pumps is crucial to prevent further climate catastrophe and to create resilient buildings with cooling benefits during increasingly hot summers. We urge the Code Council to adopt the proposed amendments to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code for both residential and commercial. On the residential side, for over a decade, Bundle has been designing all electric low energy buildings that meet and often exceed the proposed Washington Energy Code updates. As building industry professionals, Bundle wants to construct buildings that stand the test of time and help build a sustainable zero emission future for Washington. Continuing to install gas powered furnaces and water heaters results in years of additional carbon emissions. Buildings are long lived assets and is much more cost effective to use best practices from the start than to retrofit later. From our decade of work, Bundle has learned that heat pump technology is available now as a market ready, cost effective solution that fits a wide range of projects for both new construction and renovations. Updates to the Washington Energy Code that encourage the use of heat pumps is the most cost effective solution moving forward. On the commercial side, please pass option one of the commercial CR 102 with the recommended, recommended changes that Rocky Mountain Institute made in their comments submitted on 1120. Specifically, we want to ensure that their amended language for the heat pump water heating credit, the removal of the supplemental gas heating from air source heat pumps, and the clarification on the electric readiness language for both space and water heating appliances are included in the final code. Thank you. Have a good holiday. Thank you. Jeanette McKaig. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the council. I am Jeanette McKaig testifying today on behalf of Washington Realtors. Thank you for the opportunity to provide our comments today. We recently sent a letter into the council to reconsider the change in the scope of the residential energy code in which some multifamily buildings are moved to the commercial code. We are asking that that scope remain the same as it was in the 2018 residential energy code. And I'll give you a couple of reasons that were in our letter. Um, the ICC did not change the scope of definitions of covered buildings within the 2021 code, nor is has that changed in the 2024 code. In fact, the 2024 code has a note that specifically says <clears throat> not subject to public input. So the scope is not subject to public input. Our codes have retained the same definition throughout each code cycle until this year. 
So we're asking for that to go back. But the other reason that we're asking is the fact that these, some of the multifamily buildings under the residential energy code are moving to the commercial energy code. We see this as adding increased costs to these buildings that will provide future housing uh, for our population. So for example, what does that mean? The commercial code requires the use of solar and it mandates it. For a building with about 15,000 square feet of conditioned space, the solar requirement will add about $30,000 to, to the building costs. Solar is optional in the residential energy code. The cost of this one component adds to the total cost of the commercial building. And in the end, these costs are all passed on to the tenants in the form of rent and leases. One minute. Thank you. These buildings are a component of the missing middle housing bill that passed last session, House Bill 1110. And they are important for addressing the state's housing crisis. We know that regulations add to a lot of costs to housing and jeopardize the ability to build the housing the state needs. We appreciate all the work that went into the development of the 2021 energy codes, but we are very concerned with the scope change, the cost implication on housing, and the state's ability to provide the amount of and affordability of homes needed for Washington's po population. Therefore, we ask the State Building Code Council to either change the scope or to please forego the 2021 code update process and instead move forward with the 2024 updates with a renewed focus on the cost impacts of housing and on the commercial market in Washington. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jennifer Golan. I'm not seeing her in our attendees list. Oh, she spoke yesterday, so I'm not sure she wanted to do both, but she signed up for both. She tried yesterday. But she did. She got it. Uh, Jeff Gibbon. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Great. Um, hi, my name is uh, Jeff Giffen, and I'm representing the Low Carbon District Energy Association of Washington. Uh, first off, I want to applaud the 2021 Energy Code for addressing carbon emissions from the building sector head on. This is a welcome transition, which will lead to a better outcomes for the state of Washington and the planet. I also want to commend this new code for including, for the first time, a low carbon district energy systems compliance pathway, which will help boost demand for resilient heat networks that utilize local waste heat sources and renewable energy sources at scale. By nature, district energy systems create good paying jobs for pipe fitters and operating engineers that are typically left out in the transition and will help ensure a just transition away from fossil fuels. <clears throat> Don't let the perfect be the enemy of a good of the good is a saying that I I think makes sense in this in this case. Um, while I'm in favor of this this year's code adoption, I believe that there are a number of areas that could use improvement. For example, the C406 credits allocated to low carbon district energy systems do not fairly re reflect the energy efficiency and carbon emissions savings that will be achieved specifically for buildings that connect to a low carbon district energy system for domestic hot water services. I believe this omission was an unfortunate consequence of all the changes and controversies that have occurred during this code cycle adoption. And while it'd be nice to have these issues reconciled in this code cycle, I feel that it's far more important to get this code passed now and we can address these issues in the next code cycle. Uh, thank you and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Uh, we have Richard Vogue in the room who we passed over earlier. Okay, go ahead, Richard. Richard? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. My name is Richard Vogan and I live in Seattle. I want to thank the members of the Seattle, the State Building Code Council for addressing the crisis of climate change by last year passing building codes that are complementary to state law. Our legislature passed the Climate Commitment Act, which requires a 95% reduction in emissions by 2050. 
And that won't be achievable if we continue to expand and not reduce fossil fuel infrastructure and install gas appliances, which can last over 30 years. The amendments being considered today maintain the intent of last year's code to transition space and water heating in new buildings from polluting gas towards clean and affordable electricity. By allowing builders flexibility to choose appliances instead of heat pumps, you have provided a legal safeguard that addresses uncertain cases about federal law. Please include the following in the final code language. The amended language for the heat pump water heating credit, the removal of supplemental gas heating from air storage heat pumps, and the clarification on electric readiness language being available for both space and water heating appliances. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Richard. Uh, William Sampson. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I'm in Seattle, and uh, I've been listening to some of the comments, so I'll try to say uh, a few, I guess, new and different things. Uh, I just want to talk about like the extreme uh, negatives about the indoor air quality of gas. I know at my house I have an indoor air quality monitor, and I like to... Uh, open the windows for 10 minutes a day because uh, unfortunately I still have the gas uh, furnace for the heating and there are harmful chemicals that register on air quality monitors. Uh, if you have a gas furnace and, you know, don't open the windows. So I don't, I doubt, you know, I think most people who have gas appliances don't really open the windows and uh, gas also contributes to global warming, meaning more people need heating and cooling systems as we have more extreme weather events. And so that's even, you know, more carbon. And uh, I know in Seattle, I didn't used to need, uh, you know, an air conditioner, but because of global warming, I had to get one because it just got to be too hot in the summer. Uh, I also want to echo some of the things that other people have mentioned uh, about the, uh, you know, the cost issue. Uh, well, I guess I'd like to add one thing I think people haven't really talked about much is uh, what about the co increased cost of people of increased medical bills for negative impacts uh, associated with gas? So uh, I urge you to pass the... Uh, the amendments to have a healthier, uh, better climate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris Covert Bolt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members of the commission, for this opportunity to speak about the proposed amendments to the Energy Code. My name is Chris Covert Bolt. As a family doctor in Washington for 29 years and volunteering as a board and climate health task force member of the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. I urge you to adopt these amendments to the State Energy Code, residential and commercial. Please uh, pass option one of CR 102 with the recommended changes that RMI made in their comment uh, from November 20th. We want to ensure that their amended language for the heat pump water heating credit, uh, the removal of supplemental gas heating from air sources heat pumps, and the clarification on the electric readiness language be available for both space and water heating appliances. Want to make sure those are included in the final code language. This will give builders flexibility to choose appliances as they achieve energy performance and still maintain the intent of the strong energy code already in place. And if we delay it, uh, implementing these clean codes would continue the harm from heat trapping methane and carbon dioxide that gas furnaces pump into our air. I speak for my patient who nearly died of blood clots in his lungs, triggered by wildfire smoke, which is increased by climate change and warming. I speak for my young low-income patient struggling to breathe with her asthma attack, triggered by dangerous indoor air pollution caused by indoor gas stove. 
gas burning buildings and appliances are a danger to our health. So please pass these amendments to protect our residents. As the Lung Association says, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beth Budana. I'm not seeing uh, that person in our uh, attendees list. Okay. Move on then to Todd Sakai. Todd? They are here. Um, Todd, if you could unmute. Todd, you're muted. I'm not seeing any action on that one. Okay, we'll come back to Todd. Uh, Greg Johnson. Hello, I'm a professional engineer at Vista Utilities, involved with the design, the operation of the distribution system that supplies electricity to homes and businesses. I also have experience designing building electrical systems. I too strive for a greener society with reduced emissions, which is why I work on many future thinking projects, including grid connected batteries, large solar and microgrids. I not only design, but I also get to witness the achievements and the failings of various technologies. And I wanna share some of that experience with you. Uh, Washington's 2021 commercial and residential energy codes proposed credit system that demands the use of heat pumps. I'll note that heat pumps are amazing technology, which is why their use has become so prevalent. However, heat pumps have a cold weather weakness, which is why building designs have long incorporated supplemental heat into building designs. Unfortunately, the 2021 energy codes, along with some suggested amendments, have attacked the use of natural gas as supplemental heat. But what you may not realize is when you completely eliminate natural gas from buildings, you increase carbon emissions because the electricity is not nearly as clean as you think. Roughly 60% of Avista's generation comes from green sources, but this average value doesn't tell the whole story. Green resources such as hydro and wind peak in the spring, often exceeding 90% green. But when temperatures um, dip in the winter, uh, it's 20% green. Uh, unfortunately, the demand for power is the greatest at the time when electricity is dirtiest. Your heating isn't as important during the moderate spring temperatures as it's during winter's cold. The story is worse when you consider the green sources already fully allocated for base load during cold temperatures, meaning marginal electricity used to heat buildings during these periods is essentially 100% generated from either natural gas or coal. You might think that your utility is 100% hydro because you're blessed to live in Washington. However, what you may not realize is that 100% hydro utility is a net exporter of electricity to other utilities in Washington and other parts of Western US and in Canada. When the demand increases at that 100% hydro utility, uh, there's less clean hydro to export to other utilities, forcing them to turn to natural gas or coal to make up the gap. According to WEC, the authority overseeing the electric you know, utility interconnections in the Western U.S. grid, half of all electricity is generated with coal or natural gas. Shifting from burning natural gas to building uh, from built to generate power is not a good proposition because you consider how inefficient it is to convert natural gas into electricity and deliver it homes. Only about a third of the energy makes it to the destination. This means that your electric resistive heating has three times the carbon emissions of a high efficiency natural gas furnace or boiler. Unless you be quick to point out that heat pumps are 100% efficient or over 100% because they don't generate but rather transfer the heat from outdoors indoors. Um, however, it's significantly harder to extract heat when it's zero degrees outside than it's 47. Both the capacity and the efficiency plummet with temperature. Uh, a HSPF 9.5 heat pump, which yields half an energy credit under the residential option 3.3, achieves parity at 30 degrees Fahrenheit. As the temperature below, drops below this, the efficiency approaches that of electric resistive heat. Anyone there uh, who states that they're focused on site-based efficiency they are attempting to ignore the true carbon impact. Uh, in addition, uh, capacity uh, and reliability are decreased uh, with temperature uh, likewise. Okay, Greg, that's yeah. time. Uh, thank you. We have Todd Sakai, I believe, is ready for testimony. Thank you. Sorry about that. So Todd Sakai, I'm a design builder out of Kent, Washington. I'm asking you to delay the adoption of this. Uh, the big, biggest reason is we are facing inflation right now. And the Federal Reserve, obviously, Jerome, uh, Jerome uh, 
uh, you know, Powell uh, looks to the housing data, the cost of housing data. So why this costs so much more to build isn't just the heat pumps, but to make sure that the building envelope can hold that air tight. Now, you make the whole house air tight, they ask us to create more fresh air intake holes. So it's very counterintuitive when you make the house to be very energy efficient, but on the exterior walls, we have to put rigid insulation. Then you have to put furring strips. Now the siding screws and nails are gonna have to be four inches long. So the cost keeps adding, not to mention the windows, they're not fit for these thick walls. All of these things cause inflation in the building industry. The problem with the inflation, the Federal Reserve is gonna keep rates very high which makes housing unaffordable. So for me to fight for this isn't that for the environment, I am for the environment. I just asking you to delay so that we can look at all these methods as to how we need to make houses more affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> Jesse Simmons. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Jesse Simmons. I am the Government Affairs Director for the Olympia Master Builders. Uh, we are an organization that represents nearly 500 members across five counties associated with the building industry. Uh, that's in Thurston, Lewis, Mason, Grays Harbor, and Pacific counties. Um, I think much of what I wanted to say has been said here, and I have submitted a letter uh, expressing many of my technical uh, objections to the codes. Uh, but I do want to say that, you know, Creating energy efficiency is a laudable goal, and our builders are doing that. This council admits that. Uh, in an analysis released by this council, it does show that our builders are reducing and are well on the way to reducing energy uh, use in buildings by 70% by 2031. And so our builders are achieving these goals without these codes already being implemented. I also want to add that builders have expressed, builder members have expressed to me that they will have uh, difficulties in adhering to these new codes, that it will add to the expense and they'll have trouble keeping costs down. Um, and is it really the right time to add $75,000 over the life of a mortgage to a home in the middle of a of a extreme housing crisis where nearly 85% of the, of the general public in Washington can afford or can't afford the median cost home. Um, also, uh, our local building officials have also expressed concern that they will have trouble um, enforcing these codes. And so you'll have a lot of non-compliance. And so I, want, I think the council before they implement codes, they should be asking themselves, is, is uh, this going to make housing more affordable for more people? Uh, and then I also want to request that we forego the 2021 code cycle in favor of pursuing uh, rulemaking for the 2024 code cycle and get a, get this right and use common sense and make sure that we can keep costs down. Thank you. Yes. Brian DeHart. Hello, members of the Washington State Building Code Council. Thank you for giving us members of the public the opportunity to have our voices heard on critical issues surrounding buildings, energy, and the environment. My name is Brian, and I'm a product designer for KCTS 9 PBS, as well as a husband and a musician. I've lived in Washington for over a decade and have fought for action on environmental issues throughout that period, appreciating the progress that the state has made, especially the Building Code Council leading the charge by implementing one of the most climate-friendly energy codes in the nation last year. I also appreciate the foresight to propose amendments to protect these codes, ensuring new buildings in Washington are climate-friendly and cost-effective. My reason for being here today is to urge the Building Code Council to adopt the amendments um, and to please pass option one of the commercial CR 102. Time and again, we found problems in how we build and live. We used to require uh, to not require seat belts or airbags in cars. We allowed lead to be in paint and gasoline and asbestos was prevalent in our homes and schools. However, we fought through the resistance and made changes to improve our communities. In hindsight, these changes all seem so obvious. This is another one of those times where we found gas to be releasing dangerous fumes into home, causing asthma in children and le leaking methane into our atmosphere 
a gas with a much larger greenhouse impact than even CO2. The solution is obvious. Electrifying our buildings means safer communities, a shot at reducing climate change, and a better um, and a future of better, cheaper products like ultra efficient heat pumps. Thanks again for your time and letting our voices be heard. Thank you. Danny Steger. I'm not seeing Danny in our guest list. Okay. Ted Clifton. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Ted Clifton. I am a designer of zero energy homes. In fact, that's all I've designed for the last 15 plus years. Uh, I've also built over 50 uh, zero energy homes in and around Whidbey Island. And I've designed zero energy homes all the way across the United States and Canada. In fact, the Zero Energy Home Coalition has credited me with designing more zero energy third-party verified zero energy homes than any other single designer in North America. I am also the NHB representative to the ICC's new council on carbon. So I do know just a little bit about carbon and that's what I'm gonna address. This code, this 2021 code is going the wrong direction on carbon and it needs to be scrapped. This is really important. Everybody that's testified almost is concerned about carbon and you don't realize you're going the wrong direction. I'm going to give you three very specific examples. And then I ask you that you scrap this code and go for the 2024. Number one, we'll talk about the R60 ceiling insulation requirement. All right, let's talk about the way insulation works. The first R11 that we put in the walls back in the 60s and 70s stopped two thirds of the energy going through that wall. Now, if we added another R11 to that, it would only stop two thirds of the remaining third or two ninths. If we added another R11 to that, so we're at R33, it would only stop two thirds of the two thirds, or excuse me, two thirds of the remaining third of the two thirds. So as, as you get farther and farther out to deeper and deeper insulation, when you go from R49 to R60, you're getting less than 1% return on the same amount of insulation that originally in that R11 got you a 67% return. And yet the carbon required to produce and install that insulation is the same as the carbon in the first R11. So you're getting less than 1% out here versus 67%. And the testing on that has shown by the, the National uh, Energy Renewable Energy Labs and many other testing agencies that the return on energy is over 200 years. Recent studies out of Canada have shown that you'll never, ever recover the cost of this carbon over the life of the building. So that's number one. Number two, let's look at the uh, R, uh, R5 foam outside of an R20 cavity. Nobody makes R20. They make R19 or they make R21. So uh, by this prescriptive path, the builder's gonna have to use the R5 and the R21. The whole reason for the R5, contrary to what a lot of people think, is about putting the moisture, the vapor, the cond condensation of vapor, put it out into that foam so that you don't have moisture condensing inside your fluffy walls. When you increase the inside to R21 instead of R20, it moves the dew point farther towards the inside. So you have walls that still fail. And when you apply this same math and same facts and same physics to Eastern Washington, you actually need R7.5 of foam on the outside of an R21 wall to actually make it not fail. So this code causes walls to fail we're gonna have another decade of the 70s where we're building stuff that fails. We can't do that. We can't doom our builders and our homeowners and our renters to 10 years or 20 years or 30 years of failure. And that's what this code would do. It needs to be scrapped. Third example. Hey, Ted, I'm sorry you're, you're running out of time, but thank you. Okay. Your, I'll your quickly system. mention the heat recovery ventilators. They don't work in Western Washington. Right. Thank you. Ann Anderson.
Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Ann Anderson. I am a structural engineer and owner of Green Mountain Structural Engineering, which specializes in residential projects. I'm also involved in code development on a national level, having served on the IRCB Code Development Committee for the 2021 and 2024 code cycles. I also served on the ICC Appeals Board in 2020. The 2021 IECC is a flawed code, which is the reason why there were several appeals. And the Washington State amended version is flawed as well, and should not be adopted. It makes no sense to adopt a code that is fraught with problems and is going to add unnecessary costs to homes. Also, this code will be in place for less than two years. It is going to take a lot of resources and effort to get the building community on board with this new complicated code. The council is already beginning the adoption process of the 2024 code. This is where the focus should be. This is a better code. This code will require fewer amendments and does not have federal preemption issues. If you concentrate trade on adopting the 2024 codes, I believe you could get the process completed in 2025. Leave the 2018 code in place until then. Several states that have adopted the 2021 code have amended the prescriptive U-value and R-value tables back to the 2018 values. This includes Oregon, which has the same climate zone as us. They are going back to a U-value of 0 0.059 and R21 cavity insulation as well as R49 in the ceiling. This is because the U values and the R values in the 2021 code for climate zones four and five do not make sense. You simply cannot keep wrapping a house with insulation and expect better results as Ted has just so great, wonderfully explained. I see that this new version of the Washington amended code has snuck in a change to the U value for the walls from 0.056 to 0.045. This, combined with the crazy R60 attic requirement, will add thousands of dollars and take over 100, perhaps 200 years to pay off, not to mention the cost to the environment in producing all of this added insulation. The 2024 code goes back to R49 in the attic and has an avenue for a U value of 0 0.06, which allows for the cost effective in cavity insulation. I know that when skipping the 2021 code cycle was brought up this past September, one council member discreet and said something like, we can't keep, skip this cycle. We have put so much effort into this. And I agree, I, I truly appreciate all the work that goes into this, but that is not a good enough reason. This amended code does not comply with EPCA requirements. If it is adopted, there will be legal challenges. The 2024 IECC code has been developed through a much more stringent code development process than the 2021 IECC and is a better code. This council needs to make the logical choice, not the emotional choice, and realize that pushing this problematic code on our state is not the right way to go. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ed. Carolyn Logue. Thank you. Um, my name is Carolyn Logue, and I'm here today representing the Washington Air Conditioning Contractors Association and the Northwest Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association. Um, first of all, we agree with a lot of the comments that are opposing the current code amendments that are before you today. I think there's a fallacy right now in the assumption that seems to be out there that the 2018 codes are not continuing to move us towards the goals that we need to meet and that we need this 21, 2021 code change in order to do anything at all and make any changes. I also like the fact that you've moved away from the heat pump mandate because an appliance itself is not going to move towards more energy and carbon efficient homes. But the fossil fuel compliance path that's put in place needs to be based in reality. I was in a meeting yesterday, all of our HVAC contractors are, are, are saying, wait a second, these appliances don't even exist out there. Um, and if they're not available, it really then just becomes a fallacy that it even can be an option out there and, and really does, I don't think makes the code look good in terms of that it's really out there with a goal to make sure we do have more energy efficient homes with flexibility to make sure we're doing that in the best way possible for consumers and in the most affordable way. The other thing is this code is extremely confusing for all of my um, clients. And, and that confusion actually could lead to significant mistakes that over time could reduce in additional costs and less energy efficiency and the need to go back and do aftermarket fixes in order to achieve that. So we don't need that in our code either. Also, it decreases the ability to actually put in that needed supplemental heat in so many areas around this state 
where we cannot count on the power grid, the electrical grid to be working all of the time. Um, and we need to make sure that supplemental heat is there. The first thing, and I will emphasize this again, and I think I've used the, the people have used the term energy security. The first thing that happens in any crisis is we are told to shelter at home. Those crises often can, can occur, co be co-concurrent with power outages. So we need to make sure that we have ways for people to actually comply with that order that comes in to shelter in their homes safely and effectively with the heat they need because most of these crises will occur during cold weather events. Um, we agree with the fact that we should not move forward with the 21 codes. As I said before, the 2018 code is moving us in the right direction. It is creating the incentives to put in heat pumps and energy efficiency appliances. But it, the, it is not as confusing. And I, I think remember that our builders just got into being able to work with that code. It's been two years. We, we really are just now starting to see how effective it can be. And we need to move towards now, I believe, put the 2021 aside. We don't have to do it. Move forward with the 2024 IECC codes. Um, that in for our HVAC contractors and others, when you're looking at that in terms of energy standards, appliances that are available and all that also, not only does it make us be able to have a more efficient discussion, but it also moves us to a point where we are able to better match what is happening nationally in terms of standards for appliance and the availability of those appliances out there. So that we're not rushing forward with something that we're putting things in that are expensive when we really could be working on something that is actually being worked on on a national basis and can make us more able to find the things that we need to create the energy efficiency. Washington is doing a great job right now, and we can continue to do that with the 2018 code. Skip this one and move forward with 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Johnny Kocher. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, my name is Johnny Kocher. I'm a manager at RMI, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that seeks ending reliance on fossil fuels and to transform global energy system to a secure, clean, and prosperous future for all. First, I would like to thank all of the hard work of the SBCC staff, Stoyan, Krista, and all the other staff um, have been incredibly professional during this marathon of a code cycle that's gone on for almost three years. I hope you're able to get some much needed rest after this month. Uh, please pass option one of the commercial CR 102 uh, with the recommended changes submitted by RMI uh, on Monday. Specifically, we want to ensure that the heat pump water heating credit language is updated as the current language is ambiguous and confusing, not meeting the original intent, which is to provide a pathway for a 100% primary load for surface hot water heating. Additionally, please remove supplemental gas heating for air source heat pumps. This option, this should not have been included in option one um, as it did not appear in any of the previous uh, TAG or MBE meetings. I uh, went through and, and watched those meetings and it should be included in option two, but not in option one. Um, it also does not reduce EPCA risk. Uh, also, there should be a clarification on the electric readiness language being available for both space and water heating. Option one, it's a little ambiguous. It just says the word appliance instead of actually specifically stating that both space and water heating um, devices would be able to uh, receive electric readiness requirements if the po fossil fuel pathway were chosen. Um, I want to address some um, incorrect facts um, stated by Andrea Smith. Uh, first, the normalization table presented today is not based on carbon emissions as it was in 2018. Uh, it was in fact modified to be based off site energy usage and is explicitly modified to be one-to-one -one equivalent. There was already a lawsuit in Washington 10 years ago on the credit table and the court already ruled that as long as the credits are based on one-to-one -one energy equivalent and as long as one pathway allows for federal minimum appliances to be installed, then it is legal. Uh, once heat pumps are on a level playing field with natural gas appliances, their inherent thermodynamic properties mean that they are several times more efficient than fossil fuel appliances. Unfortunately, lots of physics don't care. Uh, moving heat will always be more efficient than combusting. And that is the reason why heat pump baselines and electric buildings are going to be cheaper to build up front and be able to comply with the credit table, yet still comply with EPCA. Um, thank you for your time today. Have a great one. Thank you. Claire Richards. Hi, thank you. Um, one second.
Um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to make a comment. Um, my name is Dr. Claire Richards, and I'm speaking on behalf of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. I'm a nurse scientist, and I urge you to adopt the option one of CR 102 amendments to the 2021 Washington State Energy Code, residential and commercial. Uh, some may claim that these amendments reduce energy choice by making it difficult to build a gas home. But when I moved to Spokane, our family could not find an all electric home. We eventually found a home with a high efficiency gas furnace. The exhaust was directed over the back steps and you could smell the gas. It took multiple visits to figure out that the gas was actually leaking and we were told that this was potentially explosive. Gas leaks are extremely common and pose threats to public health as well as contributing to, contribute to climate change. Despite our enthusiasm, we found that it was cost prohibitive for us to electrify the home. It makes a lot more sense to build an energy efficient home with a heat pump from the beginning. Climate change will result in more extreme heat than extreme cold and heat pumps will save lives. I also wanna to point to the wildfires this last summer affecting Eastern Washington. Gas had to be turned off due to the wildfire. Gas outages take much longer to turn back on than electric ones. Your decisions now can have an important uh, positive effect, impacts that extend beyond Washington State. We cannot delay any more, and so thank you for your time. Thank you. Did we ever get uh, Richard Volquette? Yes. We, okay, how about uh, Jennifer Gillette? I'm not seeing her in the uh, guest list. Uh, Seth Vidana, I am also not seeing, and Danny Steger, I am not seeing, but we had a hand come up from Patrick Hanks, um, who we did not get a sign up for. Okay, go ahead, Patrick. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, council chair and staff. My name is Patrick Hanks, and I am with the Washington Policy Center. My public testimony is to notify you of my concern that the small business economic impact statements included in the CR 102s for the commercial and residential energy code do not fully comply with the Regulatory Fairness Act. I made a list of potentially missing or incomplete elements as required in the Revised Code of Washington, Title 7, Chapter 85, Section 40. Um, please see my full written testimony for more information. For brevity, I will just mention subsection 1A through C which requires a cost comparison between affected small and large businesses using at least one of the following bases, cost per employee, cost per hour of labor, or cost per $100 of sales. I ask the council to bring this issue up with your staff and legal experts to confirm compliance with the Regulatory Fairness Act and take necessary action. If not, um, thank you for your time and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Patrick. Do we have anyone else that was uh, not signed up that wishes to testify? I'm not seeing any hands in our guest list. If you are wishing to deliver testimony, please utilize the raise hand feature. It should be located at the bottom side of your Zoom window. And no hands have come up. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, pause the, the testimony until uh, hands come up. We will remain available until 2 o'clock. Um, so if anybody wants to testify, I see we have more participants in the room than testimonies given. So uh, we'll pause now until we get a hand up. Let's see here. Hello there. Can you all hear me? Hello. This is Dylan. This is Dylan Plummer with the Sierra Club here to testify. Okay, Dylan, go ahead. You got three minutes. Great. Um, well, members of the State Building Code Council, my name is Dylan Plummer, and I'm the senior field organizer for the Sierra Club working on building electrification in Oregon and Washington. The Sierra Club is a national environmental nonprofit organization. And in Washington State alone, we have over 32,000 members and well over 100,000 supporters working for environmental and climate justice. Um, in my role at the Sierra Club, I've been engaged with the State Building Code Council for the past two years, discussing critical changes to ensure that new construction is being built with the most climate-friendly and efficient technologies, 
And I'm, you know, very glad to be here today to continue this advocacy. And on behalf of our membership across the state, I urge you to pass the amendments in front of you to protect the strong codes and ensure that new buildings in Washington are as climate friendly and cost effective as possible. Um, please take this opportunity to protect these common sense codes to reduce emissions, build climate resilience, and ensure that Washington continues to lead, lead the way towards a just transition to clean and renewable electricity. Thank you so much for your consideration and for your work on behalf of the state uh, and for letting me um, get my testimony in here. Thank you, Dylan. Is there any other participant that would like to testify? Okay, uh, seeing none, we're gonna go ahead and pause again until uh, another hand comes up. Okay, uh, Dustin, who do we have? We have Sean Scott. Sean Scott, you have the floor. All right, can you hear me all right? We can. Perfect. Uh, yes, my name is Sean Scott. I am a mechanical engineer working at Dume Romans Incorporated, a consulting mechanical engineering office located in Spokane Valley. I would like to compare the proposed elimination of natural gas as a fuel source in this state to a precedent set by the Washington Clean Cars 2030 bill. From the Seattle Times article titled, Washington Sets 2030 Goal to Phase Out Gas Cars, dated April 1st, 2022. No, this was not an April Fool's joke. Quote, the goal of selling exclusively electric vehicles in eight years is just that, a goal. I would also like it to be clear I have no issue with the motivation behind decarbonization. In fact, I own two electric vehicles and have personally installed 33 solar panels on my roof to charge them. However, it is clear the 2021 code is not ready to be effectively enacted. It is, in my opinion, quite short-sighted and dismissive of the well-being of the state's residents to eliminate natural gas as a heating fuel source. On the eastern side of the state, the temperature can get much lower than other parts. As an alternative to gas heating, electric heat pumps are one of the more viable options. However, the heating capacity of this equipment derates significantly as the temperatures drop below freezing and approach zero degrees or lower. This loss in capacity creates a need for auxiliary electric resistance heat. I don't think it was a coming as a surprise. I don't think it would come as a surprise to many that this backup electric heat load is greater than that of the heat pump alone. For example, a typical five-ton gas heating unit requires a 45-amp breaker at 208 volts three-phase. An equivalent five-ton heat pump requires a 50-amp breaker. However, when you add a backup electric heater, that breaker size more than doubles to 110 amps. This, in turn, increases the size of the overall electrical service for required for a new building. I know electrical engineers and utility providers throughout the state would agree that the infrastructure is not ready for this increased demand. I'm confident that due to the increased costs associated with backup electric heat and the increased electrical service required, it will frequently be cut as budgets are and will likely continue to be very tight. I am concerned this will force Washington residents to freeze in their own homes and workplaces. Circling back to the automotive industry, the goal, not requirement, of elimination of internal combustion engine vehicles was further extended to 2035, a short five months from the bill's introduction. This is according to the Seattle Times article titled, Washington will ban new gas-powered cars by 2035, following California's lead, dated August 25, 2022. I implore the WSBCC to reconsider enacting this requirement, which is clearly not ready for implementation. This change in HVAC design would be required to be made in just over 100 days from today, in comparison to the 12 years afforded to the automotive industry's goal. Again, not a requirement. I have to believe it would take that much time, if not more, to prepare the state's electrical infrastructure for increased heating and vehicle charging demand. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there any uh, anyone else among the participants that would like to raise their hand and testify? No hands at this time. Okay. And we'll go ahead and pause until we uh, get uh, our next testimony. Thank you. Okay, it appears we have uh, another individual who wants to testify. Who do we have? Angela White. Okay. Angela, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Angela White, and you guys can all hear me? Yep, go ahead. Awesome. So I'm just on here today to talk about the energy code process. And I think at this point, this code is too complicated. Housing has gotten massively expensive. Um, 
we have people out here that are really struggling. And I think that we just need to skip this code cycle and move on and be able to do something better. Because I think at this point, we really just need to put people in our communities first. And that's it for me today. Okay. Angela, thank you for testifying. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that would like to testify this time? Seeing no hands at this point. Okay. Then we will pause until uh, somebody indicates they'd like to testify. Hello. Looks like we have somebody interested in testifying. Hello, yes. yes, this is Tyler Burbage. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, hey, thank you for the opportunity to testify here. Um, my name is Tyler Burbage. I'm a project manager for RJ Development and Trestle Wood Construction here based out of Olympia. Um, we strive to develop and build residential housing of many types throughout Western Washington. Uh, we work with contractors, suppliers, and permitting jurisdictions, uh, including building officials on a daily basis. And a significant portion of our time is dedicated to ensuring regulatory compliance while providing a right price product for our local residential markets. Um, I'm just on here and, and I've, I've drafted an email as well that I'll send uh, to express my concern with the implementation of the 2021 building code, including the revised energy code and WUI, uh, or wild, wildland urban interface. Um, I am in support of foregoing implementation of the 2021 building code and directing efforts instead to the development and preparation of the 2024 building code. Um, I, I have a, a big issue with the uh, uh, the process and uh, I guess what actually happened in the code development of the 2021 code. As an active member of the Olympia Master Builders Government Affairs Committee and the participant in an NAHB training on the 2021 code, I've had the opportunity to just get a peek behind the curtain of the development of the 2021 code and um, I'm just, I don't believe I'm alone in observing that the haphazard assembly of the 2021 building code has resulted in a finished document that will result in uh, crippling and building slowdowns um, and contribute significantly to our housing affordability crisis. Um, I think that SBS, excuse me, the, the building code council members and the tag groups should actively be finding comprehensive solutions to issues that are most pressing in our communities. Um, an example of this is that the 2021 code, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, over penalizes or disincentivizes the use of backup or secondary heat sources, including natural gas. In many regions in our state, backup heat becomes essential. I think we need to work together to find reasonable solutions to these issues. A um, couple more things here, just briefly. Uh, I think that there's an issue of approval and codification of these changes. Um, I've been made aware of uh, one or more instances in which changes have been made uh, since the acceptance of the code that have not sat through a full legislative session. Uh, we just like to see that, that that process is adhered to, as that's a legally mandated process, I believe. Um, and then I just wanted to raise a, another concern here is that legislation was passed in this last term that aims to hold jurisdictions accountable on review times and penalizes them, the jurisdictions, for exceeding codified thresholds on time for review, where they'll have to um, essentially reimburse applicants for time exceeding uh, the codified limit. Um, I believe that representatives, state representatives concerned with housing affordability that even sit on your council likely supported or sponsored this legislation and that the implementation of the 2021 building code uh, will not only be overly burdensome on the private side of the building industry as a whole, but could also cripple reviewing agencies, especially those that rely heavily on permit fees for revenue generation. Um, building review timelines are uh, excessive at this point in multiple jurisdictions throughout at least Western Washington that I'm aware of. Um, Adding to that, the confusion and process of uh, implementing the 21 code in its current state uh, will only exacerbate that problem. No one that I work with has voiced confidence in implementing the 21 codes due to issues that have been repeatedly presented to the council. I urge you to please hear and listen to those public employees that work with the codes daily, including those associated with WABO and um, you know, those that, that are active in their NAHB roles. Um, I would just ask that you please consider the potential impacts on Washington home buyers as well. We as builders need to make a profit to stay in business. We're not money hungry. We have um, local people here to our area that we have mouths to feed as well. And uh, we just urge the, the council to consider the impacts on Washington home buyers first and foremost, that those costs uh, will likely be passed on to them as this needs to move forward. So please forego 21, the 2021 building code implementation and instead work toward the best possible 2024 code 
that comprehensively addresses the issues our state is facing. Thank you for your consideration. That's all I have. Thank you, Tyler. Are there any other participants who would wish to testify at this time? Yes, we have uh, uh, Sarah Nybert. Okay. Yes. Sarah Nybert here. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, I am with Affinity Homes. I'm a home builder out of um, Camas, Washington. Uh, we do Camas, Vancouver, the center, the whole area. I'm testifying today in a strong opposition of the proposed amendments for the energy code. There are simply too many credits needed to for compliance, which will increase the cost to build and raise home prices. Uh, I would urge this council to skip the 2021 energy code, remain on the 2018 edition currently in effect, and start working on an adoption of the 2024 IECC, minimizing state amendments. Um, the reason why I strongly oppose this is, is that I don't believe our power grid will support getting rid of natural gas like this energy code is trying to do. And to get rid of another heating option is giving the electric companies a monopoly on the market that will affect our electricity costs. I don't want to end up like California where we're paying so much right now. Um, it's already getting higher and higher cost of living and everything else. Um, I also would like to strongly say that before we even do any of this, we need to teach the inspectors um, what they're looking for, why we're handing them certificates. Um, if, if the people who are inspecting our houses don't know what's going on and we're complying and we're spending all this extra money to make sure our house meet these energy codes, but the inspectors don't know what to look for, it seems like we're putting the cart before the horse, you know? So um, I thank you for your time. Again, maybe some classes for the people inspecting, maybe have everybody on the same page first, um, classes for the builders and the subcontractors. There's just so much that needs to be done before this code could even become a, a reasonable code. Thank you, I take for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Is there anyone else participating that would like to testify? At this time, I see no hands up. Okay. If you uh, somebody participating wants to change their mind, just simply raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and pause recording until we get uh, more testimony. Okay, it looks like we have uh, somebody uh, willing to or wishing to testify. Well, we did, but the hand went down. The hand went down, and he's gone. Is the person still there? No. Okay, is there anyone participating that would like to testify? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and pause the meeting until uh, somebody raises a hand. Uh, my name is Dennis. I am a local real estate broker. I also work in new construction. Um, just wanted to come and say I'm against this. I really want us to skip the 2021 and start focusing on the 2024 code cycle. I mean, housing is already expensive and we just keep layering and layering and layering these overcomplicated codes. Um, can keep going on and on and on, but I think if we're really looking for affordable housing, we need to stop overcomplicating and putting burdens, burden some codes on our local jurisdictions as well, because talking to some local jurisdictions, they're not even sure how they're going to roll out with some of these codes. So my request is that we get rid of 2021 and we just um, start working on 2024. That's what I've got today. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Have a great day. Is there anyone else that would uh, like to testify at this time? No hands at this time. Okay, seeing no hands, uh, we'll go ahead and pause the meeting until uh, somebody else is interested in testifying.
Looks like we have somebody here uh, interested in testifying. Uh, can you tell us uh, who you are and who you represent? Uh, my name is Mark Shepard. Um, I represent uh, Rob Rice Homes. Okay. Mark, go ahead. I was just going in to give my two cents. I was I was hoping that uh, we could wait till the 2024 cycle of codes before we update. We're already so far into this one. There's already so many issues going on with it, and no one really knows how to adopt it um, and adapt it into the field. Uh, not to mention, we already got so many other issues going on with uh, housing prices and affordability. If the last thing we need to do is make that any more difficult on anyone else. Um, so that's my two cents. I just wanted to put that in. Thank you, Mark, for your testimony. Thank you. Is there any other participant that would, uh, would like to testify at this time? We have a hand from Michael Courier. Michael, go ahead. Hey, guys, I just wanted to verify real quick. Would this testimony be um, the same usage as a testimony that was from yesterday? Like, would I just be repeating for, for no real reason, or is this an addition to? Uh, did, did you testify yesterday, Michael? I did. Uh, if you have, have more to add, uh, feel free. No no more to add. I just wanted to make sure that I had all the bases covered. Great. Yeah, you, you, you are on the record. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Anybody else care to raise a hand? No more hands up at this time. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and, and break unless we get uh, further testimony. The recording starts. Okay, somebody signed in to testify. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself? We have Seth Vidana. Okay. Seth, go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks for <laughs> hanging out here till two. I had a bunch of stuff that I needed to get to. Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Seth Bidania. I'm the climate and energy manager for the city of Bellingham. And I uh, just wanted to say on record here that, uh, as you may know, the city of Bellingham has passed, already passed, climate-friendly building codes similar to the amendments that uh, the Code Council is looking at. And we do urge you to accept these amendments. And the big reason for us are the two big reasons. One is having a consistent code around the state will be helpful for our builders who build both in Bellingham and in greater Whatcom County. Um, we've been hearing that here, that having one code will, will assist uh, folks there. And then also just broadly, uh, having these amendments passed will help us reach our state climate targets. And as a city that's committed to climate action, uh, it's good to have these uh, uh, have the state following a similar a similar path. So uh, for both of those reasons, we urge the Code Council to accept the amendments. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Seth. Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. You as well. Are there any other participants that would like to testify? No hands at this time. Okay, we will go into a recess until two o'clock, that's six minutes from now. And uh, the meeting will conclude unless uh, another hand gets raised in that time. Okay, is there anybody that would like to testify at this time? Hearing none, it's two o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and conclude the meeting. So this hearing was held today, consider testimony on the currently filed proposals for WAC 5111R, the Washington State Energy Code, residential provisions, and WAC 5111C, the Washington State Energy Code, commercial provisions. All testimony presented at this hearing, along with all written comments received, will be part of the official hearing record for this proposal. A final decision on adopting this rule proposal will be made November 28, 2023. On behalf of the SBCC, I'd like to thank you for participating in this hearing, and this hearing now stands adjourned.